Okay, APUSH scholars, this is your end of the year review for Unit 2, and I'm looking at your review book and questions 1 through 16, in my estimation here, are really the same question. What the AP wants in short is for you to be able to answer the question, what caused the American Revolution? And you'll see the first question here is, how does the end of the French and American War change our relationship with Great Britain? They may ask you a more straightforward question, what causes the war, but um, you know, the change in relationship in 1763 definitely leads to a change where American salutary neglect is um, going to be very specifically challenged by Great Britain as they try to crack down on Americans who've been living and doing what they've wanted for close to 100 years, ignoring the principles of mercantilism and the Navigation Acts. And uh, there's another question that they asked just a year ago, and that is the revolution was complete in the hearts and the minds of the American people before the war began. And again, what they're asking you in that question is, how are Americans behaving independently? And how, well, how would this lead the war? Well, the, the change in the relationship with the Brits were leaving us alone. Anyhow, let's start with significance of the French and Indian War here in your review guide. Britain defeated France and could finally, in 1763, at the end of this war, could finally focus on governing its expanded North American empire more effectively. This meant that the long-ignored and violated navigation acts would be enforced more diligently. Enumerated goods had to be landed in England, and a tax paid before being shipped to other countries. Other restrictions included the Iron Act and the Hat Act, which limited American manufacturing. It should be noted, I don't have it on the review sheet, but there's also a Currency Act limiting the independence of Americans coining or printing their own money. These limitations were part of an economic trade theory called mercantilism. And mercantilism is an economic theory that benefits the mother country and says that the colonies exist for the economic profit and well-being of the mother country. The period of American virtual economic and political self-rule is called salutary neglect, and that's that long period, over a century, where we're doing what we want. We're paying lip service to um, the principles of mercantilism and the navigation acts, which are supposed to enforce that we only trade with Great Britain. But because England has a series of wars with France, England has a series has a um, has a civil war where the king, King Charles I is executed by a rebellious parliament. England for a century is a lot going on way over on the other side of the Atlantic. So it's the, uh, it's the final defeat of the French where the English are able to put their full attention on us and change things. Next question here was the American Revolution really a revolution? And the short answer is no because Americans did not want a change. They don't want a revolution in the sense of something completely different. They want things to go back to the way they were before the end of salutary neglect. Some political issues the Americans had with Great Britain at the end of salutary neglect, at the end of the French and Indian War in 1763. The colonists said no taxation without representation. This is kind of a mantra. This is a key thing. The AP will be looking for your knowledge of this, this phrase here. The colonists protested laws to collect taxes that they had no part in making. The Sugar Act is an example of a crackdown on collecting um, ta uh, taxes on Caribbean molasses, which was being shipped to New England as part of that triangular trade. The Stamp Act was a tax on internal sales transactions that the colonists rebelled against. The Tea Act, to bail out the British East India Company, is also another um, t t uh, tax that brings a protest. The Townshend Act a tax as a tax on import. England said the colonies were cared for via virtual representation in which British legislatures represented them indirectly as they represented the best interests of all British citizens. And the colonists would have none of this because the colonists from day one, especially when you look at the Puritan town meetings in New England, are ruling themselves and taxing themselves and having a say in what's going on. The, the, this is an assumption that the colonists are making and living. Patrick Henry says the famous quote here, give me liberty or give me death, referring to the uh, stamp tax. He says this in the House of Burgesses in Virginia. England will, um, because of a boycott, which is very effective, the businessmen in Great Britain will push Parliament to drop this very costly uh, stamp act, but England will then pass the Declaratory Act 
after backing down from the Stamp Act, in which they state that they still have absolutely sovereignty over America, and in the future they can do what they want, because they are sovereign. After the Boston Tea Party, uh, England shut down all Massachusetts local town meetings in punishment, shut down the Massachusetts General Court, and that is in the the name for the legislature, a little confusing there, but the Massachusetts General Court is shut down. Thomas Paine, very shortly after this, will publish his famous um, agitation document called Common Sense, in which he will be pushing Americans to think about declaring independence. And he lists those reasons why it's not logical for an island to rule a continent, why it's not logical for the grandson of a German prince to be you know, a king over an American people who are perhaps a fifth, not even from the British Isles. The Stamp Act, Congress, and the First Continental Congress are early successful American acts of unity to organize opposition to British taxation and military measures. So all of these political issues, um, you should have these in your quiver. You should have them in your arsenal. If they ask you to bring out political um, reasons the Americans are rebelling, you should have these at hand. Keep in mind here, economic and political are sort of two sides of the coin here, and there's not a right or wrong to use it in either category should they ask you, but be able to give specifics. Don't just say, if you say taxes that are without representation, that's true, but if you can name the taxes and the responses of the Americans and then the counter-responses of the Brits, um, that's even better. As far as economic issues, the crackdown on colonial trade interfered with American prosperity against this end of salutary neglect at the end of the French and Indian War. Remember, at the end of the French and Indian War, the Brits have won, finally, after a century of all these wars against um, France, but they are uh, in debt. The Brits need to you know, pay off the, the cost of this, this victory in North America. Taxes were unpopular, and uh, on the taxes that the Brits are trying to collect to pay off this debt, British soldiers seized illegal cargo and searched and confiscated contraband trade goods. The Tea Act gave one company a monopoly. That's the British East India Company. And Americans responded to the Stamp Act and to the Townsend Acts with a trade embargo, which is also called non-importation. Some religious and philosophical influences on the American Revolution. The Great Awakening set in motion an identification of religious freedom with freedom from established churches controlled by colonial governments. Now, this is happening 20, 30 years before the American Revolution. And what you need to see here is that this religious breakaway from established state uh, churches is practice rebellion, practice revolution, practice anti-authoritarianism. Americans are discussing, they have this vocabulary of oppression and liberty and freedom referring to their churches. So they're going to be taking this with them very easily, very readily, into the political arena when the Brits start pushing them around. To be free to worship was to demand political freedom if the state, if Connecticut or if one of the southern states, perhaps that's um, enforcing and collecting taxes for the Anglican church, is you know a church that you don't want to belong to anymore. You're not just breaking off from a church, you're defying the government. The long history of American hostility to religious oppression made them resistant to laws they did not pass into taxes which they had no say in. The Enlightenment philosopher John Locke said that men were born free and created government to be their servant and to protect their natural rights. Um, there was once a question asking the influence of the Enlightenment on the American Revolution. Definitely John Locke, that men are born with rights. They set governments up voluntarily to protect their rights. And if those governments do not protect those rights, men who voluntarily set the governments up in the first place have the right to, to overthrow these governments and to set a government which will protect them. The long history of American hostility to religious oppression. Oh, and I'm looking at, sorry, I'm looking at the other question we just did here. Um, John Locke said that unjust governments could be removed, and his ideas were directly adopted by Thomas Jefferson, who is the guy on tap for writing the Declaration of Independence. Jefferson is openly cribbing sort of the uh, you know, state-of-the-art ideas on political freedom from John Locke. Another Enlightenment person to know is Ben Franklin, who is, um, you know, he's arguing that we should live by reason um, in, his, in, his, in his writings. He's a very popular newspaper man at this time. As far as civil liberties, civil liberties refer to personal freedom, the freedom of your person, your property, not to be seized, not to be arrested, not to be thrown in jail, 
without some sort of due process. Slightly different from laws that you don't like and different from taxes that you don't like. Some civil liberties issues. Americans resented soldiers being forced into their homes under the Quartering Act. They resented writs of assistance, which were general search warrants, which violated their privacy. The Brits could come in as many times as they wanted, anywhere, looking through your, your rooms, your house, your inn, your business, <clears throat> your shed, your barn, looking for confiscated go uh, for uh, contraband goods to confiscate. The Americans were angered by admiralty courts. These are military courts that bypass trials by their peers. You get a military court of a bunch of British soldiers or a bunch of British sailors, and you're going to be found guilty. The colonists resented having armed British soldiers in their towns who threatened them rather than protected them. And one example of this is the Boston Massacre, where these young um, American teens who were you know, probably out drinking, they're angry, there's kind of an economic uh, recession, to use a modern term, happening in Boston. And there's a bunch of young British soldiers who are afraid and who are hostile to the Americans. And uh, you know, some shots break out and some Americans are killed. And, that's the Boston Massacre. That's 1770. Keep in mind, Boston Massacre is about five years before the Boston Tea Party. These aren't the same event. Some serious battles that are fought before the Declara Declaration of Independence. These are reasons for declaring independence. Some of the serious fighting, Lexington and Concord, where the Americans um, are going to be attacked by the Brits who are looking for supplies of military weaponry in these two towns. There's going to be fighting there and at Bunker Hill. Remember Ethan Allen? Green Mountain Boys, uh, Benedict Arnold are involved in seizing some, Ameri uh, some British artillery, some cannon up in upstate New York at Fort Ticonderoga. They drag these cannon down through the snow, through the woods, and they put them on Bunker Hill, pointing down at the Brits in Boston. The Brits um, will successfully take this hill at great, great loss, um, depending on how you look at it. You know, you could argue it's a British, uh, it's an American victory over the British, even though they take the hill, because the Brits will pull out. And that will be the first place where the Brits will um, sort of effectively give the Americans their um, operating freedom here. And the Brits at that point will move down to New York. Other military measures are the aforementioned search and seizure and interdiction of smuggling that violated the Navigation Acts and the military and the Admiralty uh, Court. As far as land acquisition, the very first thing the Brits do when they try to crack down on the Americans after the French and Indian War, you got to know 1763, that's the end of the French and Indian War in the beginning of this crackdown to collect the tax money the Americans have been dodging, the Brits draw this imaginary line through the crest of the Appalachian Mountains. It's called the Proclamation of 1763, and the goal here is to keep watch on the Americans, to keep the Americans on one side of the mountains, and uh, there is a rebellion going on. Pontiac's Rebellion is going on, so the Brits are sort of justifying this by protecting the Americans, by just telling them not to move, but this is denying poor Americans their crack at getting a farm, in the Ohio River Valley. It's robbing the wealthy Americans who are speculating in land of a ch chance to make some money. And remember, George Washington is a surveyor, and what that really means is he's a guy who's a, sort of a real estate agent buying and selling land. And um, also, the colonies can't get any taxation for those people who are living across the mountains as well. One final thing here, part of the, um, what are called the um, intolerable acts, which shut Boston down after Boston throws the, the tea into the harbor. Remember, they've, they've shut the colony down. There's another piece of this. It's called the uh, Quebec Act, which is going to, from a British perspective, give the, the Quebecois, the French in Quebec, um, sort of self-government. But the colonists see this as, um, you know, dangerous, giving Catholics um, self-rule. But more so, that disputed land that we fought with the French over in the French and Indian War is given to Quebec, which is now a British colony. So this land, which you know many Americans claim is being given to the French Canadians. So that's one more gripe. I'm going to go to, okay, that's questions 1 through 16. I'm going to jump down to question 17, kind of similar in some ways here. Analyze the ways in which British imperial policies between 1763 and 1776 intensified colonial resistance to British rule and their commitment to Republican values. If you notice this, I probably could have and maybe should have put this with the other 16 questions. Um, I think I, I put this separate because uh, this is in a redo, a revised version of the review guide. But you'll see here that the same, same this is sort of the same question here 
pre-1763 British imperial policies um, include economic regulation, this idea of mercantilism, of regulating the colonist trade, and which is being enforced through the Navigation Acts, which say you have to trade with Britain, only with Britain, on British ships. The Seven Years' War, which is the same as the French and Indian War, ends in 1763 with the Treaty of Paris, giving Britain a big North American win, but also a big debt to pay. Also, you should notice, um, note that during this war, the French and Indian War, there's discussion among the colonists to protect themselves against the French, who are a mutual enemy. The Americans and the Brits are allied together in the French and Indian War, and the colonists very stubbornly resist any sort of being bossed around by any sort of American provisional government, and that proposal is called the Albany Plan. And very often, AP will ask you, you know, compare the Albany Plan with the um, Articles of Confederation or with the Constitution, and you know, you should see the Albany Plan is kind of a, it's a failure to make a government. The Articles of Confederation is very weak, flimsy post-war government, and the Constitution is a successful creation of a government that actually can govern. Okay, back to the review in the book here, 1763 through 1776. The need for revenue led England to clamp down on dodging tax payment and smuggling through its of assistance, admiralty courts, and the ending of the many years over a century of salutary neglect. Remember the word salutary means healthy, something that's healthy for the Americans. Um, the Brits are, you know, they're buying our ships, they're buying our, our supplies, they're buying the stuff we grow, and they're protecting us. So we're living in sort of the best of both worlds during this period of salutary neglect. Proclamation of 1763 was meant to draw a line between the colonists and Pontiac and his Indian attacks on the frontier. And this led to resentment against England by frontier settlers leading to the Paxton Boys' attacks on the Indians in 1764. Remember the Paxton Boys are these Pennsylvania farmers way on the frontier. They're poor. They're bumping up against the Indians. And they're arguing that the Pennsylvania colonial government is not protecting them. So they're going to march on Philadelphia. And uh, Benjamin Franklin, interestingly enough, will talk them down into, you know, not, not attacking the government here. But this is in 1764. And it's kind of a, uh, a prequel, perhaps, to this rebellion against a government which is not doing what it's supposed to do protect its citizens. Again, um, going down question 17 here, um, some things bothering the Americans. The Sugar Act in 1764, the Stamp Act in 1765, which is that whole issue of taxation without representation. The Sons of Liberty are this extra legal group which are formed, they're kind of like bullies who would go after tax collectors and people who violated the um, embargoes, and they led riots. And there's also the formation of the Stamp Act Congress, and this is a group of colonists which are, are, it's not a government per se, but it's a group to protest the Stamp Act and to support non-importation or a boycott. And Patrick Henry gave, again, his famous speech in the Virginia House of Burgesses complaining about the Stamp Act, give me liberty or give me death. The Quartering Act is passed in 1765, as was the Declaratory Act, declaring that Parliament, even though they do repeal, the Stamp Act is, uh, the Parliament is, is sovereign. The Townshend Acts are a way to get around the colonial dodge, which says you can't tax us internally inside, you know, deep inside the country at the point of sale. So the Townshend Act is a tax at the docks. It's an indirect tax. The tax of the importer will sort of be sort of snuck into the price of goods. The British are calling our bluff. Um, we're saying that we will accept taxes at the point of entry for the purpose of you know, defense. The British have to have some money for, to build, have a navy, and uh, you know, we're, leading, we're going to have another boycott against the Townshend Acts, and you're going to have the Committees of Correspondence, or another group of colonials who are organizing you know, letter writing back and forth from colonies to organize another boycott, another non-importation, non another embargo. The Gaspé Incident in 1772 is an attack on a grounded, on the sandbar, British warship which is hunting down American smugglers. Um, the Tea Act led to the Boston Tea Party, which led to the Intolerable Acts. The British name for this is the Coercive Acts, which shut down the Port of Boston and the government of Massachusetts and the town uh, hall governments across Massachusetts. And this will lead to the First Continental Congress in 1774. Also, the Quebec Act will lead to fear of the spread of Catholicism. Um, and then Lexington and Concord. Key battle here. Key battle before the Declaration of Independence. 
The Second Continental Congress will meet after this, and the Second Continental Congress will begin sort of um, the, the momentum towards uh, a declaration of independence and a continuation of, of war here. They will authorize the raising of an army, and the Massachusetts will pick a Virginian, George Washington, who has experience in the French and Indian War and who is from the most populous state to get support for the Massachusetts. This Second Continental Congress will issue two documents. The Olive Branch, Branch Petition is a declaration of loyalty and fidelity and love for the king and for Great Britain and just, you know, to ask for, you know, to be, to be treated fairly and to keep the hotheads happy. There's a second document, and that's the, it's a long name, the Declaration of the Causes and Necessity of Taking Up of Arms. And that basically says, we will fight you if you send more soldiers. The Green Mountain Boys will seize Fort Ticonderoga after, after Lexington and Concord. Um, Common Sense will be written by Thomas Paine. Lord Dunmore is the governor of Virginia, and he in 1775 is going to proclaim you know, a rebellion in his state, and he will promise any blacks who join the British army their freedom. And from a black perspective, the Americans are the oppressors and the British are the liberators. And there will be hundreds who will flee to his army to join, and there will be tens of thousands who will flee the plantations. Most of our founding fathers who are Virginians had slaves, you know, duck out and take off and follow the Brits, who unfortunately left most of them behind. Uh, many of these slaves were brought back into slavery. Many of them died of exposure and disease and sort of camp followers who the Brits didn't really want to, you know, house and feed and um, while they're on the move. Finally, the Declaration of Independence is passed July 4, 1776. And that's kind of a culmination of a lot of events going beforehand. Um, and then one last question here in this unit, and that's basically, why did we win the war? A little bit different question. Um, and they give you three categories. One is political. And I'll just I'm going, I'm going down the review sheet here. The Americans fought for self-government and to maintain freedoms they had had during the long period of salutary neglect. Enlightenment ideas of John Locke defended rebellion against unjust authority. The colonists had a tradition of self-taxation, which was transgressed by the Sugar Act, the Stamp Act, the Tea Act, the Townsend Acts. British officials violated American privacy. American courts and American... Um, Trade were also violated by the by the Brits. Lord Dunmore in Virginia urged rebellion by American slaves, and this was seen as stirring up insurrection, which is one of the things that's in the Declaration of Independence. AP loves you to know that in the original document, the Brits are accused of foisting slavery on the Americans and stirring the slaves to rebel. That gets crossed out. The Southern delegates aren't really too keen on putting that in, in the, the Declaration. It's kind of interesting that Jefferson, a slave-owning Virginian, tried to put it in in the first place. Back to political, um, the Second Continental Congress offered both the Olive Branch Petition and the Declaration of Causes in the aftermath of the Battles of Lexington and Concord. Thomas Paine's 1775 Common Sense boldly set forth a call for independence, which followed in July 1776 in Jefferson's writing of the Declaration of Independence. And in many ways, lots going on. I mean, we're talking years and years and years of taxes and and violations of privacy and civil liberties and a bunch of battles going on uh, Bunker Hill and uh, Lexington and Concord. And Thomas Paine is the guy, he's the man of the hour. He's putting everything together and he says, why are we putting up with this? And he, it's sort of that, that he precipitates. He brings the, the uh, critical mass, the number needed for rebellion to that point where the Declaration of Independence will pass the Second Continental Congress. In 1783, the Colonial Congress will pass the Articles of Confederation, and this is at the end of the Revolutionary War, and this is a government of the colonies, which is meant to be permanent. The Second Continental Congress is going to be governing during the war and uh, just raising barely enough um, men and goods and money to keep the war going. Diplomatic reasons why we won the war. Well, many British sympathized with the colonists, especially the Whig Party. The Whig Party is an anti royal party. In fact, the thwar this war was so unpopular in Great Britain that the Brits had to hire Hessian, that's German mercenaries. And after the Battle of Saratoga, France joins in the fight against um, the, the Brits. The French join the Americans. And this is a key, most books call this the turning point of the war, where uh, the French give us soldiers, they give us money, they give us lines of credit. Their navy is going to basically block the rescue of Cornwallis's army at the end of the war in 1783, 
from um, from Yorktown where they're trapped um, and the military reasons well patriot advantages we have a just cause this war is not popular in Great Britain American geography is far from Great Britain there's a whole ocean you have to cross to to get to fight the Americans the Americans fight with this home field advantage they knew the land um, volunteer Minutemen are fighting you know, draftees and, uh, and, and mercenaries and Ethan Allen and the Benedict uh, Benedict Arnold uh, will take Fort Ticonderoga and take these artillery pieces down to Boston and sort of force the Brits out after Bunker Hill. Uh, Britain is going to win most of their battles and is going to at one time control all the cities that they want to take. They have Boston, they have New York, they have Charleston, they have Philadelphia, but they never destroy Washington's army and that's perhaps Washington's great achievement is to run away to fight another day. Washington um, keeps that army together and some historians argue that the key turning point in the war is Washington, after having loss after loss after loss after loss, he's been chased out of New York across into uh, the, the Delaware River into New Jersey, will win on Christmas Day against the Hessians at Trenton and then a counterattack by the Brits at Princeton. So these double wins before his army is uh, legally going to be allowed to disband convinces his troops to re-enlist and sort of a, a rejuvenation, a shot in the arm, for the American soldiers who are sort of suffering in the snow and the cold. They have this win and Washington is uh, you know, truly a hero for holding things together. You should know, um, this is sort of an aside here, Washington's army was probably a fifth black soldiers. Some of these are free blacks, some are northern slaves, and every northern colony did have slavery at this time. Nothing on the scale of the southern colonies, but you should know there was slavery in the north as well as in the south. And, you know, Washington's ragtag army reenlists. Um, Washington is this effective leader who inspired his soldiers to endure great hardship. With French assistance, Washington forced Cornwallis to surrender at the Battle of Yorktown in 1781. So there you have it. That's really, you know, there's not a lot in this review book on the Revolutionary War, but you should be able to explain, you know, what are these many reasons? Um, and again, the AP does not grade you, it ranks you, it's comparing the analysis and the content that you're going to give compared to to somebody else. So um, happy studying and uh, we will move on to unit three next time we meet which is on the creation of the Constitution after several post-revolutionary wars of this flimsy weak tottering articles of confederation government. Signing off. See you later. Bye.